pray with me? Lord Jesus, what a great thought to contemplate that when our day is done here, when the race is run, when the fight is fought, we will be in your presence, blameless, with great joy, beholding your face, and you, the source of all delights, will be a fountain of never-ending delight that such sinners as us would inherit such rich treasures is too much to comprehend, and it will take us forever to thank you. Lord, thank you for this day, for the opportunity to gather together with your precious saints to rejoice in the things we have together in Christ, to sit under your word, to be transformed by it, and we pray that your spirit would be at work in our hearts to soften us, uh, to grant us a hearing and obedience of what you have said. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, and uh, we get to say goodbye to a special friend this morning, and perhaps for some of you, hello. I want to introduce to you, if you don't already know her, Melanie. Hey, Q. Did I say it right, Melanie? I told you I was going to embarrass you. Yeah, stand up. Melanie's been with us uh, three months. This is her last Sunday. Uh, she heads back to Italy. She's working on a PhD program in Italy that brought her here to do research. And I don't know what you would do if you had three months in another country. She jumped into Grace Bible Church. She came to the women's retreat, joined us for prayer for the service, and for all of you on Sunday mornings. Um, served and just participated in the body of Christ here um, in some significant and some invisible ways. And um, just thankful to the Lord uh, for Melanie. And we just want to say goodbye, and uh, we're going to pray for you as you go. You can sit. I won't embarrass you any farther. But um, yeah, clap for Melanie. Great. Um, just know that you always have a home here at Grace Bible Church, and we expect a return in Italy or wherever. And uh, if we don't see you again till heaven, um, just thank you for your service to the body of Christ. So let's pray together for Melanie. God, we thank you um, that you bring people uh, here that intersect with our lives uh, in such significant ways. Um, thank you for the way that you redeem people and connect them to the body of Christ, the local church. And we pray for the churches in Italy, um, where our missionaries are and where Melanie serves, two different cities. Um, far from each other and in a dark place. We ask that you would grant your favor to bring the light of the gospel through Jesus Christ, through faithful servants uh, to the people of Italy. Uh, we pray that you would give her much success in all that she does for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please give our greetings to the church in Italy, will you? Thank you. This morning we're continuing our series uh, on a philosophy of ministry. This is the second to last in the series. And this morning, we're talking about the Matthew 18 process or the church discipline process. We could title this message, Discipline the Wayward. I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to read through this section together and then talk about this together. Jesus gives instructions for how to address sin in each other's lives, and corporately, together, as a body of believers who love one another. If you're looking at the Bible now, uh, we'll begin in verse 15, and read this with me. Jesus says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, 
it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. What Jesus describes here in a process of addressing sin and the life of a believer has been called the Matthew 18 process or the process of church discipline. It has been called by one author as the pursuit of prodigals. That is a particularly good description. If you consider Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, you know the son who ran away to profligate living, squandered his father's resources, and came back. And what was the father's disposition toward that son? Open arms, running, love. The father's disposition was not punitive, but restorative. This process is like that. This process is out of vogue in our day. Even parental discipline is sort of out of vogue in our day. It's right to let the children decide how things should be run. The tolerance has replaced love, and it's the wrong version of the word tolerance. Tolerance used to mean you and I disagree, and, and I'm okay with our disagreement. Tolerance now means we all have to agree. I need all of you to disagree that my aberrant lifestyle is okay. We've even changed the definition of tolerance and, and then called that love. The idea that a church would seek to address harmful behavior among its own members and even more remove a person who is unwilling to change seems like an obsolete hangover from the Middle Ages. Many churches today are unwilling to follow Jesus' instruction in this matter out of fear that people won't attend a church that actually addresses sin and its people. I would turn your attention to Acts chapter 5, 13 and 14 with Ananias and Sapphira when the Lord disciplined them, dropped them, they died in the presence of believers. And outsiders who weren't part of the church looking in esteemed the church and feared to go in. And in Acts 5, 15, the Lord added to the number of those who believed by multitudes. In other words, Acts 5 and God's discipline of Ananias and Sapphira was a remarkable church growth strategy that demarcated a line between Jesus' disciples and those who were onlookers and also brought about fear and purity in the church and was not at all a hindrance to church growth. In fact, multitudes came who believed. But churches today are afraid that if we call sin, sin, and if we attempt to address it in each other's lives, we're doing something wrong, something unloving, something intolerant, something Jesus would never do. But how often have you heard the criticism of churches? I would never step into a church. It's full of hypocrites. What is the answer to hypocrisy in the church? Address sin lovingly. Be on short accounts. Repent. Stay close to the Lord. You've heard people say, well, the churches really need to clean up their own messes. Yes, the world is calling the church to practice church discipline, hypocritically so, because if the world stepped into the church when church discipline was practiced, they would hate that too. The reality is the world just doesn't want anybody to address sin. And so to have a church that's calling the world out on sin but is full of messes is hypocrisy that the world could criticize. But a church that calls categories of sin out there what the Bible calls them and also is introspective, self-examining and addressing its own sin is not hypocrisy, but, but love and faithful witness. There are reasons to practice church discipline. Love of people is a primary reason. If someone is on a trajectory away from Christ, then what is the most loving thing to do? You see, every sin sets us on a pathway away from Christ. And, and we, when we repent, which is a daily discipline of a believer, to, to notice sin in my thoughts, my actions, my behaviors, my motives, and to confess them to the Lord, and even to confess them to those I sin against, and to return to the Lord, daily repentance is a mark of a genuine believer. 
and, and to not do those things or, or to allow each other to not be on short accounts with God is, is not a good definition of love because someone is on a pathway and a trajectory away from everything that is good, everything that is life. They're on a trajectory towards death. How loving is it to awaken someone who is asleep in a burning building? It's love. It's love. Another motivation for church discipline is the desire for restoration. A desire to see broken things made whole, to see fractured relationships mended, to see unity in the church, and to experience the blessings and glories of forgiveness. A third reason to practice church discipline is for the purity of the church. If the church neglects church discipline... And you have a situation like that which emerged at the church at Corinth, where the church is actually exhibiting arrogance because of its tolerance for known immorality. That church gets rebuked by the Lord. That church doesn't get to function the way it's intended to function. And a failure to properly address sin in the lives of those in the church is to actually endorse and encourage further sin in the church, which eventually extinguishes the church's witness, which takes away the church's power, which removes from the world the church's influence. Uh, there's a fourth reason to practice church discipline. It is the command of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus says to do these things we're going to talk about today. If we think about it the other way around, what would be the consequences to not doing church discipline? What are the consequences of a church not practicing the procedures we just read? Well, if sin goes unchecked and unaddressed and uncorrected, then the only thing that can result in relationships is bitterness. A lack of confession and a lack of repentance just produces a built-up, pent-up bitterness towards one another. Listen, there's a category, 1 Peter 4, 8, for covering offenses in love. The Bible tells us it's a virtue to a man to cover offenses. And listen, if you can cover it in love, a personal offense, you should do that. But where sin is harming others in the body of Christ and we just, ah, I'm just going to let it go. Who wants to confront? It's hard. Besides, I don't want anybody confronting me. But we're still angry about sin, hurt by sin, offended by sin. The only result is bitterness. Another thing that happens as a consequence of not addressing sin is the temptation toward personal vendetta and vengeance. Listen, if the church as a body isn't doing what the church as the body should do, then I've got to take matters into my own hands. I've got to get my pound of flesh. I've got to get this fixed. I'm going to do it. Clear violation of God's role, um, a, a violation of a faith in God's role in the exercising of what's right. God said, do not take vengeance. <laughs> that belongs to me, says the Lord. The consequence of not practicing church discipline is a church full of license. If you tell your kids, uh, don't cross the street without looking both ways or else you can't have dessert, and they cross the street without looking both ways, nearly get hit by a car, and you bring them in, and you say, oh, I love you. I, I don't want you to die by a car. You can still have dessert because I love you. Um, you've actually taught your kids to run out into the street again and again and again. consequence of a church not practicing church discipline is the consequence of apostasy. Apostasy is the eventual final destruction of one who has turned away from Christ, one who professed faith in Jesus and has fallen away, demonstrating him or herself never to have been genuinely born again at all. And any unconfessed, unrepentant, unforsaken sin is on that road, that trajectory, that pathway towards final rejection of Christ. A church that doesn't practice church discipline will be marked by everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. But we don't have a simple procedural way to address each other. Uh, we'll just do whatever we want, whatever seems right, feels right. 
course, the consequence of a church not practicing church discipline is its loss of witness, loss of influence. You only need to read Revelation 2 and 3, and Jesus, the keeper of the lampstands, walking amongst the churches and threatening to remove the lampstands if they don't fix things like this. Thyatira, for instance, tolerated false teaching and immorality. And Jesus says, I have this against you. Jesus gave to the church a process by which to pursue wayward Christians. This is the main idea of our passage this morning. We're going to unfold this process and we're going to examine this practice of church discipline through the activities of three concerned parties. Three concerned parties. Those three concerned parties are the church, that's us. (laughs) And secondly, heaven. And thirdly, Jesus personally. The first party concerned in this procedure of church discipline is the church. We read about the church's role in this process in verses 15 to 17. Anybody who has taken flight lessons uh, would know about a checklist, an emergency checklist. In my days of learning to fly airplanes and even teaching others to fly airplanes, uh, the checklist was everything. And the checklist only had a few things on it. What you're supposed to do step by step by step in an emergency situation. For instance, if the engine stops running, that's a problem in a single engine airplane. If the engine stops running, you need to know what to do. And you need to know what to do right now. This is a crisis situation. You don't have time to ponder. You don't have time to think. And you are supposed to pull out this checklist and follow the steps. And my flight instructor had a sneaky habit of getting me distracted and, hey, look out the window, look at this thing over here, something really interesting you need to see. And he would reach over and pull the throttle out, simulating an engine stop. Power goes out, everything gets quiet. That big fan on the front of the airplane that's designed to keep you cool stops moving, you're sweating. Oh no, what am I supposed to do? I gotta make up something new. No, you don't have to make up anything to do. You pull out the checklist from the little pocket next to the place where you're sitting, and you follow the instructions. And they're simple, they're clear, they're in a big font, they're easy to read. And listen, when your instructor does this multiple times per flight, every single flight lesson you take for the duration of flight training, you know the list cold. You've got it memorized. But you know what, if the, if the instructor pulled the throttle and you went from memory on the steps you're supposed to take? What attitude am I supposed to have? What airspeed should I maintain? What should I do with the flaps? What should I do with the fuel selector? What should I do with the door handles? If you did all of that from memory, you'd fail the flight. Why? Because you don't want to rely on winging it, doing it by memory in a crisis situation. Simple, clear instructions written on this thing. You take it out and you read it and you read it out loud and you do what it says, step one. And you move to step two and you do what it says and you move to step three and you do what it says and you move. It's life-saving stuff. Those of you in the medical profession, you appreciate the fact that in a trauma situation, there are clear steps to follow and you don't deviate them. (laughs) That crisis moment is not the time to be coming up with new ideas. And what we have in Matthew 18 is a simple, clear set of instructions, a checklist for following Jesus' instructions, the Lord of the church, the one who knows the human heart, the one who has prescribed for us clear, simple steps to follow. And listen, it may sound clinical, step one, step two, step three, step four. It might sound impersonal to have and to follow these steps, but it's actually very helpful Listen, if you were in a medical emergency, you would want people to follow the instructions. You would want those who are caring for you not to be overwhelmed and because of the the overwhelming nature of the crisis and the trauma to be unable to help you. You would want them to be able to follow the proven instructions. It removes the blindness caused by the emotions in a traumatic situation. Following these instructions keep us from making it up as we go. They protect us from taking revenge Notice, first of all, that these instructions come from Jesus in Matthew 18. Jesus is the one speaking here. We can simply dispense with the idea that Jesus would never do something like this. 
This procedure for the church is actually what Jesus would tell us to do when a brother sins. It's what he did tell us to do. And keeping this in mind will bring tremendous comfort when we have to go about the difficult task of addressing sin in each other's lives. Four steps, each with the goal of restoring a straying brother. Private reproof, private conference, public announcement, public exclusion. Let's begin with step one, private reproof. Read with me verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Step one. It's clear, simple. Some versions include the words against you. If your brother sins against you, which would relegate this to a personal offense. I, I don't believe those words are original. They should not be there. Um, what Jesus is talking about here is sin in general. There are other places in the Bible that talk about dealing with a personal offense. In fact, if you look down at verse 21, Peter asked the question, so what do I do if my brother sins against me? And Peter, in a moment of uh, showing his mettle, says, you know what I would do if someone sins against me personally? I'd forgive him up to seven times. Right? Jesus says, try 490. Peter, you haven't even gotten started on what forgiveness really looks like. Right? But up here, this is sin in general. What do I do when my brother sins? And, and notice that no specific sin is specified. There's no list in Scripture of the types of sins that qualify to be addressed in the church discipline process. Any sin left unchecked is a danger to the Christian and to the church. Unchecked sin hardens the heart, brings disunity, and is on that trajectory toward apostasy, walking away from Christ altogether. Whether it's immorality, false teaching, divisiveness, anger, drunkenness, gossip, anything the Bible calls sin qualifies. And as we'll see, the issue really is the condition of the heart. The focus of the church discipline process is the, the revealing of what's going on in the heart, the hard-heartedness that is on display in the manifestation of a given sin. It's the brother willing to turn from sin, or is the brother willing to cling to sin as that sin is addressed? And notice that Jesus says, if your brother sins, do you feel the family relationship embedded in this? You see, this is the responsibility of brothers and sisters in the church. This is your family. This is not the task of the elders, first and foremost. This is not the task of, of some uh, super denominational superstructure and, and some head honcho somewhere else. This is all of our responsibility. And sin here is an important word. This isn't about preferences. I don't like the color socks that guy wore. I'm going to confront him. Um, <laughs> Some habit you don't like. No, we, we have to stick with biblical, definable categories of sin. And, and if your brother sins is in the present tense, and, the, and the, the idea here is an ongoing, unbroken pattern of sin. That is a sin that's not turned away from, not forsaken, a sin that's held on to. And Jesus says, go and show. Go and show. You take the initiative brother and sister in Christ. You who love your brother and sister in Christ, go and show. And go and show him his fault. Literally, go and reprove. The idea of, of reprove here is, is uh, exposing to the light what has been hidden, uh, to reveal something for what it is. You, you go and help your brother see. There's a, a blind spot here, willfully or otherwise, and you're helping him to see. The caring brother takes the initiative out of love and out of compassion and out of concern to show him the wrong. Let's think about a couple of things that, that go into how do I do this step one. Consider Matthew 7, 5. Take the log out of your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's. Right? Your brother is uh, working in the, in the metal shop. He's on the metal lathe, and a, a little metal sliver uh, springs off of the work he's working on and embeds itself in your brother's eye. He doesn't like it. It's blinding. It's painful. It's consuming, and he can't fix it himself. And he needs help. 
The point is not, hey, we all got logs, just get comfortable with it. That's not what Jesus says. Take the log out of your eye so that you will be able to remove the speck from your brothers. He doesn't like that speck. Or, or he likes it, he doesn't realize what damage it's causing. And you don't want an eye surgeon with a sequoia grove growing out the front of his face doing delicate work on an eyeball. Right? Here, let me get that speck out of your eye while I weave this redwood forest around. So take the log out of your eye so that you can see clearly and help your brother. Another thing to consider is what Paul says in Galatians 6.1, and I want you to turn there, because this gives us sort of the disposition of this difficult task. How should we view this reprove your brother? If you're looking at the New American Standard, there's a heading over Galatians 6 that says, bear one another's burdens. That's a translator's uh, addition to kind of give a heading. It's a good one. This comes under the banner of, of carrying each other's weights, helping each other out. And Paul says, brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, do you see there the idea Paul is getting at is, is not a personal offense, but the same idea we have in Matthew 18. A general offense, you see something that is harmful to your brother, harmful to the church, and he needs help, help bear this burden. And he says, you who are spiritual, similar to get the log out of your eye, restore such a one. There's the motivation. Restore such a one. In a spirit of gentleness, there's the attitude. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. This whole idea of if anyone is caught in any trespass, we can think the idea is, well, Christian, you're walking around, you come around the corner, and you see your brother sinning. You caught him. Aha, I caught you red-handed. That's not the verb here. The verb here is more like to be entrapped. That is, you're walking through the forest, and, and you hear these dull groans, this agonizing whimper. And you think, well, what is going on? Somebody is, is really hurt. And you come around the corner and you see that your brother there in the, in the middle of the forest has, has got his leg snapped shut by a bear trap. Compound fracture, his femur's in half and pieces of bone are sticking out. Blood is everywhere. And your, your brother needs help. He cannot get the bear trap out. He's caught. Sin has entangled him. And you who are spiritual, with gentleness, pry the steel bars of that bear trap off of his poor leg and bandage his wounds and help him be free. Amen. Bear one another's burdens. This is love. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 18. Show him his fault in a public announcement in the church of Sunday morning. Send a mass email to, to the church. Have Allie let everybody know that your brother's in sin. Um, share it as a prayer request at the next small group meeting. No, that is not what Jesus says. Show him his fault. What does it say? In private. This is critical. This is so wise of our Savior. It, it's so counterintuitive to what we would be tempted to do. Uh, we love juicy gossip. Uh, we love the, the holier-than-thou self-justification that comes from putting somebody else a little bit lower than us. All those things are, are in our flesh. We, we would naturally tend toward those things. Now, this is love. Jesus says, share with him your concern in private. And then the goal is in verse 15. If he listens to you, that is, if he listens as in hearing and heeding, if he gives up his sin then you have won your brother. I love that word, won. You have gained him. Now, that word is used uh, a lot of places in the New Testament to describe just wonderful, glorious gain. To live as Christ, to die is gain. You've gained your brother. You've won him over and you get him back. The father gets the prodigal son back. Listen, the father felt like he had gotten his child back from the dead. Slaughter the fattened calf, best robe. Bring my son in here. We are celebrating this is a party. 
The goal is restoration. The motive is love. The process is over. The sin is confessed, turned from. It remains private. And the result is rejoicing. Go back a few verses in Matthew 18 and you hear Jesus describing the 99 and the one sheep. Verse 12, what do you think? If any man has 100 sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for that one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones, these precious ones, his children would perish. That's the heart of this process. There's a reason they're back to back in Matthew 18. Step one does not always work. The step one happens, by the way, all the time in the body of Christ. Why don't we hear about it? Because it's private. Little corrections, admonish one another, stay on short accounts. We sin, we recognize it and confess it and turn. Or we sin and someone else helps us to see it and we confess it and we turn. It's called parenting. It's called marriage. It's called living with roommates. It's called life in the body of Christ. It's called small group. This is daily life together. We all have blind spots. We all have the ability to be hard-hearted, defensive, slow, to turn away from sin. We need each other. But there's no guarantee that if we follow the procedure in verse 15 that the sinning brother will turn. And so Jesus gives us step two. This is a private conference. Verse 16 if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. This is more than just you going to your brother. You know, the church discipline process cannot be carried out by one person. A church leader cannot excommunicate an enemy. A Christian is not able to remove someone from fellowship all by himself. And an accusation is not valid simply because it has been made. We have an example in Scripture of a sinful, self-absorbed man who actually excommunicated people all by himself. He was a one-man church discipline army, Diotrephes. In 3 John 9 and 10, John writes this, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, doesn't accept what we say, we the apostles. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, not satisfied with this. He himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. That is Matthew 18 misapplied, a one-man wrecking crew. Step two involves more than just you. And that's really good if it is a personal offense and you're the offended party. It's really helpful to have other people involved. Jesus knew what he was doing. Step two does not necessarily happen immediately following the first attempt at step one, by the way. Step one can be multiple conversations. Go to your brother. Maybe expect that your brother's first response is a little bit defensive. Aren't we all? A little bit protective, <laughs> Give some time, give some prayer. I know there are some sins that threaten the body, right? Um, Paul says, reject a factious man after first and second warning. That's a speeding up process because the nature of that sin is damaging to the body in a, in a quick way. Somebody that's predatory or, or thieving, the, the, these things can be accelerated. But, but in most cases, um, you can slow down and have multiple step one conversations. But this step two in verse 16 is Jesus' gracious process for the restoration of a sinning brother. You take two or three more in addition to yourself. And the purpose is stated here in verse 16, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And, and listen, they're not witnesses to the original offense. The, this isn't a trial. Um, they're witnesses to the reproof and the response. Uh, this is to be thoughtful, patient, genuine, loving reproof by the reprover. What if it's not? What if somebody's really upset that somebody else wore the wrong color socks and is going to take them to task, and I'm telling you, buddy, this is step one. 
um, in this step two, witnesses come along and, and they actually protect the accused against a specious argument, a fallacious accusation, against falsehoods and lies and bearing false witness. And they help govern the process to be one of love and patience and genuine care. And they are also there to be witnesses of a hard heart. If the one has stiff-armed the reprover, and two or three more come who are close and they care and they can witness that hard-hearted stiff-arming of reproof, they can plead with the one, turn. What is this revealing about your heart that, that you would rather have your sin than this faithful brother or sister in Christ who loves you? And step two is designed to bring restoration. And it doesn't always work. That leads us to step three from the lips of our Lord in verse 17, a public announcement. Jesus says, if he refuses to listen to them, to the two or three plus the one, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. This is not private. Steps one and two are private. This is public. A public announcement to the church. And this can be to a segment of the church. It can be told to the elders of a church or to the small group or to a ministry in which that individual is involved. It can be a statement to the whole church gathered. And often at Grace Bible Church, this is done in stages of telling it to the church, in ever-widening circles of influence and involvement. The one, the few, the church... The effect of this widening circle of exposure is actually the demonstration of a heart attitude in the one who will not forsake sin. The goal of step three, tell it to the church, is not punitive, it's restorative. This isn't punishment. Um, this is love with the goal of restoration, unity, and fellowship. But the unrepentant one demonstrates that he would rather cling to his sin than to his spiritual family. He has rejected the loving admonition of the one. He has refused the loving conference of the few. And now the church is informed so that they may collectively pursue him in love. And what is on display in the rejection of admonition in widening circles is a hard heart. That trajectory is apostasy. The writer of the Hebrews warns us about that. Hebrews 3, 12, and 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. And here the church gets involved, verse 13, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hope for the hard-hearted is found in Jesus' instructions here. Perhaps he will listen to the church. And if not, there is a fourth step. Second half of verse 17, this is public exclusion. Jesus says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I'm a Gentile. I'm a taxpayer. I don't have anything against the IRS, really. What's this, what is this about a Gentile and a tax collector? What is Jesus saying here? Uh, for, for his Jewish audience in this time period, a, a Gentile was an outsider. And that's different than a God-fearer. You see, a Gentile who attached himself to Israel and to the God of Israel was no longer called a Gentile, but was called a proselyte or a God-fearer. So to call somebody a Gentile was to call them an outsider. To call somebody a tax collector was even worse. That was most likely a Jew who had been a traitor, a turncoat, and betrayed his own nation and taken up the Roman cause of collecting taxes, of collecting exorbitant taxes, of lining his own pockets with the people's money as he's scraping off the top, enriching himself at the expense of his own people. That one was awful. And, and, and consider, consider a brother in step four as a Gentile or a tax collector, an outsider who hasn't come in or one who is in and went out, that kind of outsider. 
By the way, do you know what Matthew was before he became a believer? <laughs> Tax collector. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> what a trophy of God's grace. This is a command from Jesus, this public exclusion. This, this process, though painful in what it reveals, is not optional. It's actually the mark of a biblical church. It's, it's why we're talking about it in a philosophy of ministry series. You can't be a faithful church and not do this. The goal here in step four, like the goal in step three, and the goal in step two, and the goal in step one is restoration of a sinning brother. Still restoration. And, and this is not a prohibition of all contact. Uh, the rest of the New Testament gives us some specific, specific instructions about what kind of contact we are to have with a brother or sister in step four. But this is removal from fellowship from the benefits of being a part of the body of Christ while you are denying by your deeds what you say you believe. There can be no real fellowship with someone who has hard-heartedly rejected all that a believer holds dear. Someone who stays in the nuclear family and says, I'm part of this family and, and I hate everyone in it and I hate all the stuff in it and I hate what this family's all about. How can you have real conversation? How can you have real fellowship and love and unity? The unrepentant one has successively removed the layers of the church from his own life. And sometimes we think about this process backwards. Well, the church just removed this guy from the church. Well, yeah, there is exclusion, but it really is the recognition that the individual unrepentant sinner has removed the church from his own life, stiff-armed the one, stiff-armed the few, rejected the church. And sin, by its very nature, is isolating. You have to remove yourself from relationships to hold on to that sin, that sin that breaks relationship, breaks fellowship. And you're willing to break those sweet, precious relationships because you love your sin more. How tragic. One theologian said this, and I'll quote at length here. Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. And the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. And this can happen even in the midst of a pious community. In confession... The light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and the seclusion of the heart. The sin must be brought into the light. The unexpressed must be openly spoken and acknowledged. All that is secret and hidden is made manifest. It is a hard struggle until the sin is openly admitted. But God breaks gates of brass and bars of iron. Since the confession of sin is made in the presence of a Christian brother, the last stronghold of self-justification is abandoned. The sinner surrenders. He gives up all his evil. He gives his heart to God and he finds forgiveness of all his sin and the fellowship of Jesus Christ and his brother. The expressed, acknowledged sin has lost its power. It has been revealed and judged as sin. It can no longer tear the fellowship asunder. Now the fellowship bears the sin of the brother. He is no longer alone with his evil for he has cast off his sin from him. Now he stands in the fellowship of sinners who live by the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ. The sin concealed, separated him from the fellowship, made all his apparent fellowship a sham, and the sin confessed has helped him to find true fellowship with the brethren of Christ. To confess and to be free is to come back to life and love and an army of open-armed prodigal fathers who can't wait to throw a party. Does the person whose sin is being addressed like this procedure? No. Not often. Maybe not ever. <laughs> Do you like to be woken up while in the middle of a deep sleep? When your house is on fire? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> Please. 
Do people complain about the process? Hey, you didn't have to use cold water and splash it on my face. I hope you see the wisdom and the love of Jesus in the simple, clear procedure he's given to his followers. It would be unbiblical, unloving to be indifferent or to condescend or to live in self-righteousness or to have cowardice or to express a false love and sentimentality that won't address sin. To fear meddling in other people's business, it would be a sin to be vindictive or to take revenge or to deflect from our own faults by pointing out other people's sin or to have the hypocrisy of telling the world they need to repent but refusing to do so as a body of believers. There's lots of ways to get this wrong, but there's four simple steps to get it right. Neglect of this duty is not love. Any more than neglecting the discipline of your own children would be love. Proverbs 19.18, discipline your son while there is hope and do not desire his death. You see, the opposite of discipline is not love. We know the danger of sin. We know its ability to entrap and to deceive. We know its ability to be contagious and to infect One has said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you are willing to pay. Do we understand that? The loving thing to do is to help a brother or sister become disentangled from the deception and the death that sin bring. The unstated step five of church discipline, the welcome mat and the celebration and the party. Unity, fellowship, love. I don't know if you've ever been part of a Matthew 18, step five. I have. It's beautiful. It's what we're all longing for, praying for. There's an important Matthew 18 sandwich in this chapter. It's good to read the whole chapter. Scott Maxwell has preached Matthew 18 in its entirety to try to give us a context here. I'll just summarize a couple of things. In verses 1 to 5, you have to be humble like a child to get in. So anything that keeps us humble like children is good. Verses 6 through 10, we're to remove stumbling blocks that cause God's children to sin. Community stumbling blocks, personal stumbling blocks. In verses 12 to 14, we are to pursue the prodigal sheep out of love and concern. The discipline process in verses 15 to 20 is then followed by the forgiveness of personal offenses in verses 21 to 35. And you remember that parable. If we use a $10 an hour wage, the guy owed $3.75 trillion. If you put it on a 15% credit card, he owes $44 billion every month on a debt he cannot pay, never hoped to repay. He's got an infinite debt against God. God forgives him and he goes out and strangles the guy that owes him 8,000 bucks. Forgive. Forgive. The love, care, and forgiveness sandwich in which the process is right in the middle of all of it. Humility, purity, love, discipline, forgiveness, they all go together in the plan that Jesus laid out. There are two other participants in this process of church discipline. Um, I will forego detailing these two participants, but the second participant is heaven. Jesus details in verse 18, heaven's endorsement of this process. Whatever you bind in heaven, and this is a future perfect tense, a couple English translations get it right. Whatever you bind in heaven shall have, or whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, what you and I discover in the Matthew 18 process, heaven already knows. This is God's gracious provision, Jesus' gracious procedure, simple steps to follow that actually go about revealing the invisible, the human heart, that you and I couldn't assess, the motives that we couldn't see, but heaven knows. And there's another participant in this process we cannot forget, and it is Jesus himself. His personal presence is with us in this, verses 18 and 19, or verses 19 and 20. If two of you agree on earth about anything, it's the anything in this context. It shall be done done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. The conjunctions in this passage clearly connect it to the church discipline process. You can't separate it out and make it about a a Wednesday night prayer meeting or, or some other thing. 
This is about Jesus' personal presence in this very difficult process. We need Jesus' proximity here. Listen, it's hard. It's hard for me when you lovingly, patiently address my sin. And I need Jesus in it. And it's hard for you when you have to go to a brother or a sister whom you love and help them see a blind spot and, 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 and help them see that you love them as you're pulling apart the steel trap that has crushed their leg. We need Jesus in it. And Jesus promises to be there. I am there with you. To neglect this is just a failure to trust our Lord. It compromises the church's integrity, cripples the church's witness, dishonors the church's Lord, and fails to love the church's people. On our church's website, there is a series of sermons on this topic. You can search by Matthew 18 or the church discipline process. And the pastors here have, have preached a number of sermons on this topic. If you have questions about this or, or how this is done, even why this is done, um, any of the pastors at Grace Bible Church would love to sit with you and walk you through this. If, if you find yourself in a situation where you need to address somebody and you want to make sure you're doing it right out of love with the goal of restoration, the elders would love to walk with you in that. If you need to address any of the elders about things you see in their lives, we want you to do that. We have blind spots. This is Jesus' process of love for his people for the keeping of his lampstand, for shining the light of Jesus to a world of darkness. We must do this if we are to be faithful. Let's pray. God, thank you for your kindness to us. You know us so well. You know what we would do if we tried to make up our own process for this kind of thing. And we're not particularly good at loving each other. We err so often on the side of rank neglect or self-righteous indignation. God, give us love. Give us your shepherd's heart to go after the straying sheep. Give us tender hearts that are eager to be addressed as we need to be addressed. Give us fortitude and stamina and a confidence in your promise and in your proximity as we walk forward in each other's lives in these things as necessary. It's in your name we pray.